Well, thank you, Rob. And so wonderful to meet everyone here. Anyone who feels comfortable, please turn your camera on just because I love, this is what I love is saying hi to people and teaching and that kind of thing. No pressure, no pressure. Nice to see you, everyone. Good to say hello. So my name is Janusz Wellen. I'm a meditation teacher and psychedelic preparation and integration coach. I've been teaching meditation uh, full-time now for about a decade. And uh, my background is that I began meditating when I was uh, probably around 13. I grew up in this little hippie farm in Rhode Island and meditation was one of the, uh, one of the tools that I had to navigate reality. And of all those various tools, meditation was the most durable one. My introduction to meditation was much more on the side of um, uh, sort of serious transformation than what we've come to see meditation as mostly today, which is something to calm ourselves or make ourselves a little more tranquil. And so tonight we're going to be exploring meditation as a, a transformational system. Uh, and we're going to be looking at it as really a very deep psychedelic. And we're going to look at meditation as um, something that works uh, both in consort with uh, psychedelics, but itself is actually uh, known for creating some very significant psychedelic states. And um, there's a big problem in, in, uh, in psychedelics, which people talk about all the time, that they'll have a psychedelic experience, but they won't know how to bring that into their lives. Well, for thousands of years, uh, meditation has been focusing on what is the meditation technology on how to take something from being a state and turn it into a trait. So that's a little of what we'll talk about tonight. But I am mostly here to answer any questions you have from my perspective. So um, any other pertinent details about myself? Um, basically, I've, uh, you know, um, been uh, training for quite some time under teachers like Shinzen Young, and I was empowered through him and uh, through Spirit Rock Meditation Center. Um, I've traveled the world to sit with living masters and learn from them. Um, and the most, uh, the majority of what I learn is actually from my practice, but mostly actually from students, because the majority of my practice is actually guiding people. So we'll do some meditation tonight, a few different times, if that's uh, permissible for folks. And I thought what we'd actually do is just start with a short meditation now. So what I'm going to have you do is find a nice, comfortable position. I'll encourage you to practice in stillness. It helps amplify the practice, but go ahead and find that nice position where you can be comfortable. If you want to close the eyes, that's totally acceptable, or you can let the eyes rest on a single point. That's not a screen and not text. And we're going to do a very simple meditation. We're going to just tap into a tiny bit of gratitude. So just whatever we might be grateful for. We might be grateful for just being alive. We might be grateful for the fact that we can hear voices from all around the world. And in our mind, we're going to use a word to represent that gratitude. We're simply going to say, thank you. This is a, an ancient practice of cultivating this quality of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Just repeating the phrase in our mind each time we notice any piece of gratitude. And of course, we don't need to do anything that feels fake or false. Sometimes this can feel a little contrived, but just see if there's any sense of any gratitude that you can locate, even a little speck. And maybe a little gratitude for all of the people who are here with us today. People from all over the world who've worked quite hard to make it possible for themselves to be here today. Complex and difficult lives, but they were generous enough to take the time to be here right now. So directing a little gratitude to all of those little boxes that are on our screen, if our eyes are closed, just that sense that there was the screen in front of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanking people for what we might learn from them, from their questions and from their experience tonight, after tonight. Thank you.
And in this meditation and several times tonight, I'll point at different ways that the mind tends to work. So one way is as a kind of laser. So notice you can focus in on the screen, even if the eyes are closed, the sense that it's in front of you. But you can also get a sense that there's actually people coming from all around the world. So rather than looking in front of you, let that gratitude or even just some awareness go out to the sides, way out on this wide stretching, large earth in front of us, behind us. And you'll notice you need a different part of the mind to do this. Thank you in all directions. Also recognizing that from all over the globe right now, there are people thanking you. So you can say thank you to receive that. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. And at any point you can zoom in to look at one particular person in the mind or on the screen or you can open up in this wide spacious way. These are two important ways that the mind functions and that we navigate reality. Thank you. We can thank our bodies for being alive, for life itself, this magical force that's been sticking around for billions of years just to make this possible. Thank you. We can thank all of the people all around us who've made the technology possible that you can hear my voice right now. That we can have this meeting. And thanking ourselves for the capacity to learn and grow. This body mind is capable of incredible growth so thank you for that opportunity so you can begin to allow a little bit of light into the eyes but notice usually when we begin to open the eyes after a meditation we suddenly jump into our ordinary self. So as you begin to open the eyes, let that practice still continue. Thank you. Thank you. Opening up to this field of gratitude, receiving and transmitting. They feel quite similar in all directions. Thank you. So this is a theme I'll come back to a number of times tonight is this idea of omnidirectionality versus sort of a directed uh, facet of the mind. This, these are two uh, central themes in the history of meditation. So I'm being very ambitious tonight. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. So I try to really organize stuff. So if we're lucky, we're going to get through five topics. One is... Uh, that mindfulness is more than just a tool for relaxation. That's not what its original function was. That meditation has a long history of um, psychedelic exploration, effectively. And that, like I said, we're trying to get these effects to be more than just sort of decor. We're trying to get them to be actually the structure of our experience of the world. Uh, certain meditations lend themselves to this kind of psychedelic experience and this kind of healing. And then next, we're going to look at how these work in consort with each other, psychedelics and meditation, how these um, work together. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to move from something being a temporary experience, a state, to something being a permanent way of being, which we might call something like a trait. So something that's very important to understand about psychedelics is, uh, and I think this is true for meditation too. There was a study called the Good Friday Experiment. Um, I think it was technically called the Marsh Chapel Experiment. And this was an experiment where they gave psychedelics to divinity students on Good Friday in this beautiful chapel. 
and then afterwards had them report on their experience in a sort of standard psychological report. And the majority of these divinity students, uh, I think it's eight out of the 10 in the experiment group who had uh, a large dose of psilocybin, um, those folks reported classical uh, religious experiences, touching the face of God effectively. And one lucky person in the control group had the same experience. So that's a very high proportion of people to have a religious experience where they actually have contact with God. And that started to open this idea that meditation, uh, rather that psychedelics aren't something that they, they have an effect, rather they have a kind of multiplying effect on something that's already there. This is the idea that it's a non-specific state amplifier. So effectively, the computer gives us what we put into it. So with that in mind, uh, meditation and living in a way that is in, let's say, uh, in line with our values, which is a kind of living meditation, uh, this is one of the best ways that we could possibly uh, um, arrange our psychedelic experiences, if that's something we're interested in exploring, is to have a mind that is one that we're choosing. What I like to say is that we're already always meditating all the time. We're meditating on you know, the horrors of our newsfeed. We're meditating on the anxiety of our newsfeed. <laughs> We're meditating on uh, you know, the stress of work, these kind of things. We're already investing in a way of relating to the world. The question is, is it in line with our values? So for me, meditation is figuring out what is important to me and then developing a way of relating to the world that is in line with what is important to me. So. If we look at meditation today, meditation is largely considered something for relaxation, um, something to de-stress. But if we look at even the origins of, of how we got here, uh, it shows that we're looking at something that was built to be more transformative. So today's modern mindfulness is brought to us by something called MBSR, if you're familiar. Um, there was a, uh, a particular, uh, doctor, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who went to a meditation retreat and came back and said, what if we use this material or you know, the surface of this material as a way to help uh, with PTSD with veterans? That made it, you know, that brought it into legitimate research, that brought it into the medical establishment. And from there it expanded. And if you've ever heard the term mindfulness, the likelihood is it, it's because of this person and because of MBSR, which is mindfulness-based stress reduction. So that the marketing on mindfulness as a stress reducer just shot to the surface. But the way that I like to, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in a second. So the origin though of these mindfulness retreats that John Kabat-Zinn himself went to was that in Burma, one of the big traditional early Buddhist countries, in the turn of the century, they were battling uh, effectively culturally battling uh, Christian missionaries who are coming in and trying to rewrite uh, the history and sort of take over. And so their tactic, um, unlike other Buddhist countries, was to use the most modern technology they could find to teach the masses to awaken, to experience classical liberation, the modern technology being like the printing press and the locomotive. So out of that, they created something called the retreat. And they have these long silent retreats that would bring people to very, very deep transformation. What we would, uh, you know, in Buddhism often call a classical awakening to bring them to these experiences. And these folks would then, you know, go out into the world and hopefully protect and save Buddhism was the, was the premise of this. But it had really never been done before that it was taught in a way that was meant for a large group of people rather than a small uh, group of monastics. So the origin of our popular mindfulness is, uh, you know, comes from this very light version of the very deep stuff that was meant to transform who we are. So the metaphor that I like to use is that meditation was designed to be a rocket ship. And it's as though we found this rocket ship and people discovered it and brought it to the West. And people found out amazing things about this rocket ship. Like it has a shiny reflective surface. 
And it, you can go to this incredible rocket ship and you can fix your hair, you can fix your makeup, you can even fix your clothing. It's just this incredibly versatile tool. But of course, people are often missing the fact that it is designed to do something very, very, very different. It's designed to transform our entire relationship to reality. So in traditional uh, meditation, of course, these states of you know, deep transformation were just a given. This is assume this is part of the landscape. But as Westerners, we tend to be somewhat skeptical, as we should be, of some of these claims of these transformative states coming from just from meditation. But luckily for us, uh, people have begun to do the research and they started to find that these very deep transformational states have analogs in the brain, have analogs in our physiology. Um, and when you hear stories about Buddhist monks, for instance, having full gallbladder surgery with no anesthesia and being fine, um, this is an indication that something else is happening here that is not just like this person is slightly relaxed because I don't know about you, but I'm not in a place in my life where I could have gallbladder surgery without any anesthesia. So what we're referring to here uh, from, a, from a Buddhist perspective uh, would be called classical awakening. Now, throughout this, you'll hear me refer to Buddhism a lot. I'm not a strict Buddhist by any means, but if we look at meditation technology, if we look at who spent the most time figuring out how to wake up, um, every religion has some facet of waking up in their tradition, but Buddhism just spent the most time on it, the most years and, and looked at it from the most angles. So we just tend to refer and default towards Buddhism, but I'll talk a little bit about different technologies and different traditions. So classical awakening is effectively, uh, it's, it's, we've taken it from being this thing that sort of sounds like Santa Claus, like it's for magical people and, you know, unrealistic to something that is actually available. This is something that is learnable over the course of not an entire lifetime. Of course, it can take a lifetime and it'll, you'll deepen for a lifetime. But my meditation teacher, um, Shinzen Young, says that you know, if you take it as seriously as uh, like a serious hobby, you know, within five to you know, 15, 20 years, you can experience what might be called a classical awakening, which is, uh, if you think about the potential benefits is, is very significant. So I'm going to define classical awakening because often it's very vague. I'm using a, a pan traditional definition. This is my own definition, um, largely because I teach from a, uh, like a meta systemic view. I'm looking at all these different systems and how they relate and using parts and pieces for different, uh, for different reasons. So basically when the body mind defaults at metabolizing pain on one hand, and the splendor of existing on the other hand, by default. So we've transitioned from a place where we can sometimes handle pain and it's fine, or we can sometimes have the splendor of existing and that's lovely, wonderful. But now the system has switched to a place where that is, that is default. That is what we're experiencing as the, our, our baseline nature. That's what I describe as classical awakening. And luckily that's a completely trainable skill. It's uh, not to demystify it so much that it just seems like very ordinary, but there's a degree to which it really is. This is what meditation has the capacity to do. So just a few of the big experiences in meditation that might sound a lot like psychedelics. And I want to draw this comparison because there's a strong correlation between a number of these experiences. So for instance, in early Buddhism, they would have something called the arising and passing away, which is where everything is just a complete flow. It's just appearing and it's disappearing. Everything is just, in a sense, being born and dying all at once, all of experience inside and outside. This very clearly sounds a lot like a psychedelic experience, and it's very closely um, tracked. A lot of the experiences are very similar to what you might describe in a uh, psychedelic experience, but that's like the middle of what would be called one of the early, you know, maps of classical awakening. It's the arising and passing, but you have a, a number of other stages that you need to go through into, until you get to the end, which would be called Nibbana or Nirvana. That is the zero. That's the end of everything that, that is um, so deeply fulfilling that nothing else is needed. It's, pure fulfillment. 
um, it's a neutrality that is completely freeing. So that's an early Buddhist map of classical awakening. Uh, there's also something in uh, Kundalini called Kundalini awakening, which is like an energetic movement that's you know, very intense, often associated with the arising and passing in early Buddhism. In Zen, there's something called Kensho, which is uh, often used interchangeably with Satori, which is a taste of the path of awakening. It's enough of a taste that you now have a direction to go to, uh, go towards to create the experience of awakening. And awakening in Zen is much more about merging with everything, everything being one experience. Inside and outside is gone. Self and world are, are one thing and collapsed. If I look at a flower, I am the flower in that way. There are things called jhana and samadhi states, which are places where the mind can be so, let's say, balanced that uh, it's as though there's nothing in the world except for the object that you're observing. Uh, in Christianity, there's they talk about the cloud of unknowing. Um, there's uh, you know mystics like Saint Teresa of Avalon, who is actually effectively like a jhanic master, uh, the uh, levels of, of uh, absorption states. And then in middle and late Buddhism, we talk a lot about the number of different terms, which I think can be, if you view them, view them from a certain lens, can be seen as effectively interchangeable. So those terms might be emptiness, true self. Notice how weird that is that we're describing emptiness and true self as one thing. Non-self, same thing, non-duality. And all of these can actually be interchangeable. You know, in Christianity, we have God. That's the term we use for the same experience on the experiential level, not the uh, not the belief or the or the um, ritualistic level. So, how can these all be the same in these different traditions? Well, if we're moving towards something that is, by its nature, pre-linguistic, something that is so deep in the human experience that it's below the level of language, which is very surprising for experientially it's like how, how could that be it's below the level of the ordering structure of the mind when you return you can use any poetry to describe what it was it was a, i touched the face of god or it was complete and total emptiness or it was true self it's who i actually it's my true being and so we can use these different um traditions to sort of nudge ourselves along in that way um and if we get enough of a sort of metasystemic view, we can just pop into any tradition and, and go deep, um, knowing that they're actually talking about the same thing. It's the, the conflicts disappear. Usually when you get you know, theologians in a room together, they're all arguing, no, this is different than this, and et cetera. And then you get contemplatives, people actually do the practice in the room together. And they are all like, oh, I know what you're talking about. I've had the exact same experience. And then we look at the fact that certain psychedelics seem to mirror a number of these uh, uh, the ways that we can experience awakening. So let me just check here. Um, I want to check if there are hands up. Nope, there's no hands up right now. If you do have questions, let me know. I am entirely happy to take questions. I want just want. There will be a hall Q and A at the end, but right now, feel free to pop in if you do have a question. So certain psychedelics tend to uh, mimic or mirror. Uh, certain meditative experiences, certain experiences that bring us to these very deep states. So in Buddhism, which again, not a strict Buddhist, we're just talking about meditation technology. There are two, and you know, these come up in all traditions, but I, I, again, my, my background is largely in Buddhism and uh, my personal opinion is they've developed the tech quite a bit. So there's two different paths. You could talk about the path of difference and the path of similarity. You talk about the path of splitting the world into its constituent pieces or the path of totalization. So one way to look at psychedelics in categories would be things that bend boundaries or break up the world. Um, an example might be a psychedelic level of ketamine would be very much, you know, kind of shattering the world. If anyone's seen the Doctor Strange movies that like the mirror world, this is what that kind of experience can be like. Um, just as a side note, I don't know how many people are nerds and are into like Marvel, but the people in the meditation world loved the, the, uh, Dr. Strange movie, the first one, because 
it's, it's about how meditation can make you obviously, you know, have superpowers, which is, you know, of course, meditation, people love that, but the things that they were showing visually, it, it's not that it looks like that, but it feels like that. There's one scene where the sort of meditation master, I should have, I should have pulled that up. Maybe we'll pull it up at some point, but it's a short scene. The meditation master, like hits the student who's Dr. Strange and he goes in this very, you know, psychedelic world and it, some psychedelics can, but, but in meditation, it doesn't necessarily look like that. Uh, but it feels exactly like that. That's exactly what the experience feels like. So there is, there is psychedelics and that tend to split the world up and break them into pieces, or will tend to warp. We have our sense of who we are and it tends to melt into other things. And things are sort of, we're seeing symmetries in, in things and connections that we wouldn't have seen before. And there are other psychedelics, uh, 5-MeO is probably the best example that will totalize everything. It's actually, it finds the same in everything and just turns everything into like, basically like a, 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 a sort of undifferentiated field. This is interesting uh, because this is also what happens in meditation. This is another indication that what's happening in meditation isn't uh, adding something new. And what's happening in psychedelics isn't adding something new. It's already something that was in the brain and the body already. And it's just bringing that to the foreground. It's also interesting because all of the experiences one can have in uh, meditation or rather the other way around all the, all the experiences you can have in psychedelics, you can have in meditation. So this is, I'm going to make a bold statement here. And if you don't believe me, that's okay. You don't have to, but this is, I, I hope people can feel the gravity of this having done a, a, a large amount of different psychedelics from all, you know, in all different forms, um, including the ones that are often considered the strongest psychedelics and like the strongest form I found nothing that is more psychedelic and more uh, transformative than meditation. And people who do a lot of psychedelics, they don't like, they often are like, well, you know, I don't know about that. But my personal experience is that that is the case, that there is a level of depth, uh, clarity, and mostly subtlety that is just very much not the case with um, psychedelics. So recently I taught a uh, week-long silent retreat and uh, some of the people there, um, I do, I mentioned, I do um, psychedelic preparation and integration with people. And there's some people there who did some uh, uh, journey work after the retreat. And I was very curious to hear from them uh, meditation, a uh, rather a psychedelic journey after the retreat. I was very curious to hear from them. How did the two compare? Because you know, I'm, I'm very curious to hear for, from other people's perspective, what was your experience? And the report was generally the same, that the psychedelic experience was very rich and deep and multiplied the, the info that had been fed in through the retreat and that the retreat had was effectively more profound. And I think that there's something significantly different about something that happens for X number of hours and then goes away and we're effectively back where we were to something that can happen for days and weeks at a time, but we're just doing it. But we're not doing it by like holding our breath or doing some crazy thing. We're doing it just by observing this. And as strange as this seems, I've yet to figure out why this is the case. This particular moment has all of that stuff inside of it. It's locked here and it's pregnant with infinite possibility. It has all the things you can experience within this moment. And so a lot of meditation is actually finding that subtle quality within this particular moment. And then just paying attention to that and paying attention, and hanging out with that and hanging out with that until it becomes part of the wiring of our perceptual experience. So I would be a bad meditation teacher if I didn't actually let us explore some of this stuff ourselves, because uh, I'm not a meditation talker. I'm a meditation teacher. So we're going to do a little bit more meditation. Um, if folks want to once again, find a nice comfortable position. So I'm going to have you go ahead and let yourself look around the space that you're in, whether you're indoors or outdoors. Don't look at the screen because that's a little bit trickier, but just, not the room you're in, but the volume of space 
in front of you. That could include the objects as well, but the size and the sort of overall experiencing of the space that you're in. In other words, take in the space. And the mind will probably say, this is not important. We have more fun things to think about, like our to-do list or any other number of things. And we just say, okay, and just come back to this volume of space. And for a moment, I'd like you to recognize that you're not obviously perceiving the space in the room. You're experiencing the mind holding the space. That's the experience. All right, you can look out into something, but aside from some visual data, it's the mind holding that space. You can even be certain of that by closing the eyes. If the eyes are open, you can still have a sense of that space even though the eyes are closed. So, Space is not something that just occurs in front of us. So hold that space that's in front of you, that volume of space. It's, let's do it with the eyes closed starting now. Include the space in front of you, but also include the space of the body. Of course, it's the same stuff, it's just space. And also include the space that is behind you. You'll probably notice that this is difficult to do in one way, and that's exactly correct. It's hard to keep them separate and hold them. In fact, it's often hard to be present and hold them. It can feel disorienting, even confusing. So one of two things is occurring. You're able to hold all of these spaces together in front of you, space of the body behind you as one collection. In which case it will probably be a little weird, a little disorienting, which is actually the direction we want to go. Or it'll be a case of the mind sort of just jumping around from one thing to the next, which is also normal. But notice when the mind jumps around from one thing to another, it's just a part of our experience. It's not the whole of our experience. So spatially taken the totality of all of the space, including the space of the body, all around you, all the other stuff, you don't have to work too hard, just whatever is present, whatever space you can easily perceive, even with the eyes closed, as one collection. You notice that that space comfortably just moves through objects. All objects have that same empty space, just like the body, just like the air. So notice that there's part of the mind that will be pulled to objects. The world is just made of things and shapes and this kind of thing. And there's part of the mind that just sees it all as one collective field. If you're seeing it as one collective field, this is what is more commonly referred to in Buddhism as awareness. It's like the lantern of the mind shining in all directions. But if you're seeing the world in pieces, there's a section over here and then it jumps and there's a section over here. That's fine. That's more of the laser of the mind. This is more of a, an early Buddhist practice where the mind is very pointed. But for a moment, notice too that here with the eyes closed, all of our experiences are only available in this moment, our memories of our childhood or what we did yesterday or what we plan to do after this meeting, they're all here. 
And from our perspective, there's no world other than this one. We can imagine one, but we're imagining it right here. This is very much what we discover in a psychedelic experience that all of our world, all of our history and our emotions and our relationships are found in our experience right now. So the sound of a bird can remind us of sounds throughout our lives, very deeply bringing us into those experiences, for instance. If there's a, let's do this just for fun. Notice if there's someone who is doing the meditation or experiencing the meditation. We usually experience the meditator as though it were behind the eyes somewhere in the head. So include that space that the meditator takes up, that sort of unfindable area behind the eyes. Include that in the overall space. And notice that often this creates a kind of disorientation, confusion even. Confusion is okay. Confusion is new experiencing. And this may or may not feel a little psychedelic, maybe, so maybe not, a little disorienting. Or maybe not, but whatever is happening, the clarity of it is probably increased because we're paying attention. And if we're distracted, that's natural too. We haven't made a mistake. It's a normal experience meditation is to be pulled away. Just come back. So again, allow yourself to slowly open the eyes. And if there's any tranquility or uh, acceptance or peace that came from that meditation, let's not throw it out. Meditation's over, so we just start to move. Okay, let's, we're all done. Let's really try to mix these two experiences of being in a meditation and being in the ordinary world. This is a lot of how we learn to integrate this material into our lives, letting these two mix. This is what our ordinary word world feels like, of course, but it has this little extra tiny bit of a tiny bit of meditation. So again, I'm, I'm not big on sort of um, these sort of woo-woo concepts. I mean, I'm, I think they're fine. They have their place, but one concept that can be very misunderstood is, is the idea of karma. All karma means is the momentum of previous moments. So by meditating for a few moments, we have the karma of that meditative experience. So we choose, this is part of the big principle behind karma. We choose how we're going to live the rest of our lives based on how we live this particular moment. So the choice to really care about our experience in this particular moment is setting future selves up one moment from now to have a better or a more present experience of this particular moment. And my, you know, general, uh, you know, general thing that I want to uh, impart on people is like invest, invest in this moment. This moment is the most important and most impactful thing you'll ever have contact with. And this is one of the things psychedelics do, do is they push us into this particular moment, but just like someone who kind of gets addicted to skydiving, um, we can't actually be falling through the sky all the time. It doesn't work very well, but we can weave that into every facet of our lives. And, uh, and you know, I'll tell you now that my ordinary experience of the world is really quite psychedelic from a from a perspective of where I was, you know, when I was younger. Um, it's very strange, but it's also just ordinary. It's like, of course. This is how it always was. It was always this strange, always this fascinating, always this rich, but I just would ignore it. I'd notice something really rich and be like, yeah, that's cool. I want M&Ms, you know, <laughs> whatever we do as humans. Um, so that's just a, my, my, my uh, soapbox there. Invest, invest friends. Um, okay, so checking again. Actually, let's take a moment now. Typically, if we do a few questions or comments or um, reports, 
after the meditation, then we're, we're going to report the experience rather than the sort of things we can talk about. So I'd be very curious to hear from people um, what their experience was in the meditation. Alec, please. And Alec, before you say anything, I just also want to mention if you had, if it didn't make any sense and you're like, this is confusing, it didn't work, whatever, tell me and I'll happily, you know, give you a little bump, uh, some support. So, but please, Alec. No, I, I think I understand it all perfectly. No, I, um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but actually it's the, something that is lingering with me from the meditation and sort of a lot of the things you've been saying thus far is this element of confusion and strangeness and weirdness. And in my own experience with, um, less so with meditation, but more so with um, psychedelics, weirdness and confusion is really primary for me. And I often find it kind of distressing. And so, um, and I'm sure people um, who have, you know, are working clinically with with people uh, using psychedelics and psychedelic therapy, the just holding the balance of feeling very confused and how mm -hmm. unordinary, and we're used to feeling quite ordinary, or some of us are, um, and how to work with that um, clinically or when you're teaching meditation. When, because for me, when when confusion and weirdness come in, that's when I start to get uncomfortable um and so yeah i just want to yeah. I, I don't often hear people focusing on the confusion and the weirdness when we're talking about psychedelics or um or meditation it's often the bliss the awe the um yeah. the boundless love but the confusion is real um and yeah. so i oh, just yeah. wanted to lay that out there and maybe have some discussion about it absolutely so um, there's entire traditions, right? That in, in Christianity, the cloud of unknowing was basically based on using the confusion as the object of meditation. But there's an, an entire, you know, portion of, of Zen, a huge portion of Zen is focused on the confusion. Um, I don't know if you could argue all of Zen, but basically um, the mind tends to perceive all of our experiences as an answer. This is what it is. This I use this bell in every demonstration. This bell is just, that is what it is, right? It's, it's so obvious. There's no confusion about that. It's just this, it's, it's this thing. But we can also look at the same thing as a question, not a specific, a sort of generalized question. Like, is it? I mean, is that what I'm experiencing right now? Is this, is that actually copper colored? Is that what that looks like? Is that, and just at a raw perceptual level asking, is that the experience? And you notice it's the same experience, except the mind is now, it's, it's, it becomes new. It becomes something that it hasn't seen. It's like, well, I don't know. Um, and that's a lot of what drives meditation is the unknown, the inquiry. So in um, anyone who works in a clin clin clinical setting will know the insight is a very important uh, experience. People talk about, okay, you know, we're trying to move people towards insight. From a meditative perspective, Insight is just discovery of the perceptual experience. Insight is literally like if you can taste the taste inside your mouth right now, that is insight because it is particular and you've never tasted that before. There's a part of the mind that's like, yeah, I have, but well, I'm sorry. The fact is at least not in this moment, right? So it's, it is very much new. Working with the confusion is another question. And, and I want to stay a little on track because I, I feel like I could go on forever, but basically the way I would look at it is that there is a part that doesn't like the confusion. There's a part that is confused and it's like, I don't get what this is. And there's possibly a part behind that that doesn't like it. And to, in order to protect, it says, oh, let's, let's make this all ordered. A lot of the struggle in, uh, you know, in meditation world, the deep existential struggle of that happens on the path of awakening is called the dark night of the soul. And ultimately that is a fight between parts of us that want and know and see freedom and then parts of us that need stability and safety. And there's often this incredible tension between the two. And until we can recognize that they, they have the same goal, we're, we're in trouble. So my sense is find the part that doesn't like the confusion and just 
love that part. Of course. Yeah. This is really confusing. I see that. I see that you're confused. That must be really hard and let it know that it's okay to dislike it. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a short answer, but hopefully that's a little bit helpful. And I'll talk more about, and we'll have a, a whole sort of section on this so we can talk a little bit more about it later. Um, Want to leave a little space for one more report if one, someone wants to report on the meditation experience. What happened? It's as a, as a meditation teacher, you just don't even know. You're like, well, tell me what happened. My, my only tool is the voice of the student. So um, I think, yeah, Eva, please. Hi, um, thanks for that. I feel like something that you said at one point during the meditation about feeling the meditator behind mm -hmm. the eyes or in that space, Sure, that was really helpful physically for me to feel the space in a different way and actually felt like it kind of emptied out my head yep. and kind of opened up my ears and like so I I liked that invitation a lot it was, awesome. was helpful to get the space all around nice yeah so um how to, how to talk about this so uh the inquiry of of is there a watcher is there someone watching or who is watching right now is very powerful and we, I'll talk a little bit about IFS in a little bit, but in IFS, there's this concept of self, which I want to talk about actually comes from, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-dual practices. It is, it, it's, it's not a, uh, it, it's, that's the, the roots of IFS are in non-dual meditation. Um, so it's funny because they don't really talk about it that much, but I'm like, well, don't we want to take that a little bit further? If this is a really good thing that helps us, we'll just take that, you know, we'll just go down that, the, the rabbit hole with that. Um, but inquiring on, is there a viewer is basically a good way to tell, am I experiencing the world from a part or am I experiencing from the whole? So this is also people often, you know, get a little surprised by this. If right now you have a perspective, there is me, I am here and I'm looking at the world. That makes sense. It is a part, it's a part of you. It's a psychological sort of unit that is not the totality of your experience. You can tell it's not the totality because it separated the world into me and, and everything else, right? There's the inside, there's me, and there's all that other stuff. Well, that means we can perceive all that other stuff. So any perspective means that it is a self and any self can be seen through until we get to a effectively like a totality of all experiencing. And then we get the joy of being able to, you know, sort of be in drag and be like, oh, I'm a self for a little while. Like, this is cool but we don't have the prison of being locked in the experience of a self. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, a few more things and then we'll open it up to Q and A. Um, so basically, um, let's see time, okay, great. So we wanna look at how meditation and um, psychedelics can work in consort. Um, I'm talking about meditation itself as its own psychedelic. I, I wish that they would just categorize it that way and say, you know, there's, you know, MDMA, which is really heart opening, but it's also a little hard on your system. And there's psilocybin, which is, you know, very natural feeling, but it can be emotionally overwhelming for people who have trauma and like really clearly talk about these things. And then in that same list, you say, and then there's meditation, which is, you know, it takes, you know, unlike other psychedelics, it takes, you know, five years to kick in, but you never come down and all of your world is woven with this like splendor and joy of existing. Um, would you like to try it? I wish that that were the way that people talk about meditation, but you know, we're getting there. So we want to talk about also how do we use actual meditation in consort with psychedelic work. So for doing preparation and integration work for people around psychedelics, I basically am, it's, it's largely meditation based. Um, and obviously I do IFS with people as well. So uh, if people don't know, IFS means internal family systems therapy. I'm not a therapist, but I'm trained in IFS and uh, it's a powerful modality. I can talk about how that relates to meditation if people are interested. Uh, the meditative roots of IFS, if people are interested. Um, so the big things that I recommend for people in preparation is the number one thing is values. 
getting clear on what your values are. And I have an exercise that people want it. Um, I think we can, I can afterwards include some links that people want uh, links. I can send you some or however we can get your link. I have an exercise to figure out what your values are and then to um, get very clear on the degree to which you're living within those values. You, you can just do this yourself, but uh, the, the basic idea is get really clear on what your values are and then how much you're living those in your life. Um, living within our values is one of, the, one of the highest predictors of fulfillment in our lives. Because for me, I'm not teaching cool psychedelic experiences. I'm not teaching awakening uh, first. I mean, I'm teaching these, yes, but not first. I'm not teaching like how to relax or you know, how to connect with your teenager, which are all things that I teach. Ultimately, what I'm teaching is how to have a fulfilling life. So I'm very concerned with values and then helping people try to make decisions based on their values. So you have your list of values and then you look at, okay, should I, you know, go on this vacation or should I, you know, quit this job or any even small decision that you need to make? What should I eat for dinner? And just run through your values and say, does this fit with my values, right? Because you might say like, I really want, you know, fried chicken and some, and a soda. And that might be really great. And you look at your values and you realize, well, health and longevity and, you know, uh, my family are really high on these values, but having fun is a value. So which one, you know, do I look at? And so you, you have to find a balance for yourself, but then you're making decisions through your values and then you're living in your values and you're in a cathedral of your own good decisions. Um, and that is basically how we move ourselves towards fulfillment. So the number one tool for preparation and integration with psychedelics is values. And that's basically living meditation. Every tradition has different forms of how we interact with our values. Very important. Um, I like IFS, internal family systems, as a modality. I strongly recommend if you can, if you're so situated, to find a practitioner who can guide you in IFS because it's very, very different than doing it yourself and understanding the model. Understanding the model, the part that understands, if you know what IFS is, is a part. And it's very hard to get outside of that part if you are trying to navigate it. So you outsource that to somebody else if you can ideally, but you can also do, I have a meditation that I'll do with people where I'll just help them understand what parts are referring to an IFS. And then you just go back and forth and you say, a part of me is really interested in finishing the sentence. That's my part. And then they might say, oh, a part of me is, you know, feeling a little nervous because we're talking to each other. And I say, oh, a part of me is really interested in what you're like. And I'm excited to find out. And you just go back and forth about what's happening internally for various parts. And it's a very powerful, very powerful meditation. Um, I will say that because I have a big emphasis on IFS, I'm also invested in the early roots of IFS, which is the non-dual meditation practices. Um, and so I do a meditation with people that I call whole part. And basically you can do it right now. Um, observe anything in your environment, take a pick a thing and observe it. Okay. There's a thing. Got it. Now, as you're looking at whatever this thing is also recognize that this is not the totality of your experience. This is a piece of your experience. This is a part, not the IFS part, but it's a, it's a, it's a part of my experience. So you can take in that little piece, that section of reality, or you can take in the totality of all of your experience. So try to do that for a second. You can look at the piece, the part of your the thing you're looking at, or you can close your eyes, but take in all of your reality as one big chunk right now. You don't have to add anything to it or, or, or reach out and I forgot about memories of grandma and stick those in there. Just whatever happens to be this particular moment, the totality of that experience. And that would be the whole. And you're just sitting there labeling whole and part, whole and part. You can hang out with the part and then notice that it is part within the whole. That's one meditation. You can hang out with a whole and notice that distraction will take the form of being pulled to any little specific piece. But these are both greasing the skids for the mind to be trained to take in the totality of experiencing. So there's a something the Buddha said, which was that a you know teaspoon of salt in a cup of water is undrinkable. A teaspoon of salt in a lake is unnoticeable. So so often our pain and our difficulty is the side, like it, it zooms into the, to the view of our 
face and eyes. And we think we are the pain and we're just consumed in the pain. And to recognize how large is this pain compared to the volume of all of the room that I'm in or all my experience together. And you realize, oh, it's a small portion. But there's also a saying in Zen that you can hold a leaf so close to your eye that it looks bigger than the moon. And that's what's happening. We're so focused on whatever this pain is that we can't actually literally see that there is space around us. There is a open space. Even if we can't open our eyes or we decide to have keep our eyes closed in a psychedelic experience, that there is a larger experience around us. That is a very significant um, tool. Uh, and it's a very significant meditation tool. And then the last big meditation tool that I work with people on is uh, kind awareness, which is right now, notice the space around you. Actually, let, let's do this exercise real quick. This is actually really powerful. I want, if you, if you ignore everything I've said, or you're tired, um, see if you can wake yourself up a little bit. This is the important bit. So go ahead and take in that space again, the space in front of you. You can let the eyes rest on a single point, or you can let the eyes move, whichever is easier to help you take in the space around you. And I'm going to have you ask this space a question. The mind will answer immediately, but I want you to ask this space. Sounds weird, sounds goofy, but let's give it a try. I want you to ask this space, do you have a to-do list? And the mind will immediately be like, no, that's dumb. But ask the experience of the space. You'll notice its answer is deeply silent. It clearly does not have an agenda. It doesn't have a thing it's trying to do. You can ask this space. You, you, this is the little monologue beforehand. You know, a lot of the world is trying to get me to be someone a lot of the time. I feel a lot of pressure. Are you trying to get me to be someone specific or be different right now? And you'll probably notice that the space is not trying to get us to be different at all. It's just space. The mind will tell you that this is dumb, but that's just the part. It's like, oh, this, this is so silly. Of course, it's just the space doesn't have a to-do list or want us to be somebody. You can also ask the space about any problem that we have in our lives, right? Do you, uh, do you judge me? Do you think that I am not enough or do you think that I have failed in some way? And now we might notice that we feel that we're like, oh yeah, but I feel, I feel like I've made a mistake or I need to grow or, you know, one day I'll be good, but not now, or this is just basic shame. But the space is very, very neutral. And the mind, again, I'll say this, so what? It doesn't matter. We're focused on this area, not none of this stuff. But imagine if we deeply, deeply took in the fact that we are constantly surrounded with and filled with a, you know, say a material, but a, an experience that doesn't need us to be any different than we are. Doesn't need us to change. Doesn't need us to grow. Doesn't need us, to, our, our, our most, you know, like the worst thing we've ever done, our most perverted thought, like our, any of these things, this space is actually totally fine with all of that. It accepts us exactly how we are. That's, that's, that's pretty big. I mean, I, I don't know anyone who could totally, no matter what happens, it accepts me completely exactly as I am. Each person has their limits, right? But this space does not. And so it's actually the fact that this, and I'm referring to this space, but it's more generally just awareness. Awareness doesn't need anything to be different, doesn't need me to be any different whatsoever. And there's a way in which that's incredibly welcoming. Just it welcomes anything that enters into it. It's an incredibly kind way to relate to anyone. Just be exactly as you are. You could be a total mess. Totally acceptable. It accepts every single part of me, which I don't accept every part of me. Part of me is like, no, you should change or grow. This thing's wrong. You know, this could have been better. But this space does. So imagine like a turtle. We just had this space for the rest of our lives that was completely neutral all around us all the time that we could tap into and just get peace from get 
you know, rest from. And, and at first it seems very sort of dumb and novel. We're just looking at the space and asking like, you know, if it needs something from me, but it's extremely profound. And there are, you know, people wouldn't do this for thousands and thousands of years attending to these qualities if they weren't life-changing. So I didn't talk so much about how do we move from something being a state where it just happens to something that is a trait in our experience. The shortest version is repetition. We are writing and rewriting our own neurons all the time. The meditations we did here today were just little touches, but you know, it's a numbers game at some point. If you think of our, uh, the body mind as a kind of AI and artificial intelligence, and it's being fed data in order to learn how to you know, exist in the world. Um, if we're all day long feeding it data, that's like, you know, uh, resentment or, or obsessively, you know, scrolling or whatever we're feeding it, it's going to say, that's how the world works. This is, this is how reality is. But if we're feeding it enough data that says, actually, look how neutral it is. Look how spacious it is. Look how friendly the experience of reality is. Um, our system just starts to shift in that direction. And, and when I talked about classical awakening, we're talking about the system finally shifting to that as a default. And how do we get there? Repetition, 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 right? How do we get to Carnegie Hall, people? So that's the general breakdown. That's all I have to say. Um, now's the really good part. This is where we get to find out from you. Uh, I don't know. Tell me about your reality. What would be helpful to know? Anything that I said that would be supportive or anything at all? I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Craig, I think, has a hand raise and is unmuted already. Yeah, so Craig. that was, uh, I'm, I really appreciated. Craig, I'm going to pause you real quick. Something is rubbing against your microphone. Uh, sorry. That's okay. Has that stopped? Yep. Great. So that was an extra, I deeply appreciated what you walked us through. It was extremely clear. And what I mean by that is I've either, tried to meditate or read about or listened to people talk about meditation for many years. And I feel like that was the first time that I was led through what I could internalize as a clear description of the nature of the subjective reality of it, if that makes sense. Absolutely. That's a very, that's a very clear description. So my next question is, given the myriad of traditions, I've liked how you described your own approach as sort of being uh, across these different traditions, but rooted in Buddhism because they have the best worked out tech. What is the best way for a practitioner to go deeper along the lines of how you were teaching? Yeah. So, I'm biased. I don't know if anyone noticed, but I have a particular view and it's the metasystemic view that you, one wants to have some agility in which systems you're interacting with. And you're almost intentionally moving through different systems. Um, so the sort of grandfather of uh, metasystemic meditation is a teacher named Shinzen Young, he's my teacher. And his view was to look at all these different traditions to create a kind of periodic table of meditation elements what are people actually doing in every tradition, in every religion, not just Buddhism, obviously. Um, and what, is, what are they actually doing with their minds? And then to see, if we look at all those pieces together, we can see little holes in our periodic table, et cetera, and start to be able to navigate this entire field. Today, I gave a very simplified view, which is two ways of relating to all meditation, which is that the mind is pointed at something or the mind is open to everything. Um, so, there are just excellent teachers in the metasystemic field. So one thing I want to do, can I, Rob, can I give folks a link? Is that acceptable? Totally. Okay, great. Okay, so in the chat, I want to see if this, this works. Um, I'm going to include, oh, there we go, it worked. That is uh, 15 meditations that I give to all of my, um, the first students I work with. Every time we start, we use these same 15 meditations. You're welcome to do some or all. It's a good place to start. Um, that's one thing I want to recommend. It goes through and really systematically, uh, decon it's a deconstructive practice where you're looking at each one of your senses, uh, seeing, hearing, and feeling, and 
deconstructing that way. That's one good resource. Another excellent resource is a podcast called Deconstructing Yourself uh, by a teacher named Michael Taft. Um, it's also Shinzen Young student, but he's again talking from this meta systemic perspective. It's not a beginner's podcast, so just a warning. The other thing is uh, Shinzen has a book called The Science of Enlightenment, which I highly recommend. So those are good places to start. Um, you can also, you know, reach out. This happens to be the thing I do all the time. So I'm happy to help anytime. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Does that answer the question? I'm assuming. Well, if not, raise your hand. Yeah. Raise your hand. No, absolutely. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thanks for your practice. And I appreciate your clarity. I feel like it's, it's, I, I tend to, you know, work with people who just want, <laughs> they want to know what's going on. So I appreciate that clarity. Um, Tony, have your hand up. Thanks for uh, thanks for your time. I really like the word you used in terms of like technology to mm -hmm. achieve these states and how Buddhism and psychedelics are different forms of kind of the same technology. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any other examples in like the modern world of different types of technology. One thing that comes to mind could be like sensory deprivation. Floating. Absolutely. Um, but if you had any additional types of technology that you found particularly helpful um, or that you've tried yourself and also yep. um, Secondary question, but would love a link to that values exercise as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that is, um, if you go, okay, let me just see. If you go also to my website, which is, um, let me figure this out. If somebody, actually, Rob, if you wouldn't mind um, just putting this in the chat because it's going to take time, it's just my, my website, which is in the, right there. But instead of 15 foundational meditations, it just says tools. Uh, so deepmindfulness.io slash tools, or you can just go to that website that I just said, deepmindfulness.io slash tools. The values exercise should be there. Um, what's the next thing? The next question, what was the first half of the question? Uh, around technology. Different oh, yeah. So basically, I mean, the term that I've heard is psychotech, which is, you know, technology or things that have developed to, to explore the mind. And all of these things are, you know, I think all of the stuff that you see people explore are, are valuable psychotech. Um, right now, I'm just the most enamored with um, IFS. IFS is built to be this kind of bridge between this transcendent, totally non-dual material and our ordinary lives. Um, I think of it as this very smooth, this beautiful sort of shape. And when we first start meditating, it's like we're on our ordinary lives and we're going to this cool transcendent stuff. And then we take psychedelics and we go in this total transcendent area. And we, we have a sense of this is the direction to go towards freedom. And then we get all the way out here and we see that the space is completely neutral a million times. And it hits us so hard that we're just changed forever. And we think this is the direction. I need to go in this direction and escape my life. But actually we start to realize that we start to loop back and find our way back to this ordinary. And we realize, wait a minute, this is just the same material. This All this stuff is actually the same dance of material. And in Zen, they have a phrase called form is emptiness and emptiness is form. Um, that our ordinary lives are the same awake thing. And the awake stuff is just what the ordinary is built out of. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that is the case. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. How about other questions? Folks, hit me with those questions. I'll, I'll jump in and say a little bit about that meditation, that kind awareness meditation. I really, really like that. Um, caught me by total surprise, but in a really good way. Um, and my kind of reflection on it, I was like, oh, this is, this is unconditional positive regard almost, right? Uh, and what is it like to receive that? And we talk about it kind of like, you know, in, in uh, child development, right? Like that's the infant caregiver relationship. That's mm -hmm. like, oh, this is still, you know, like you could potentially receive that from the space around you. Uh, and that was, yeah, I'm still, I think I'm going to have to sleep on that for, you know, a few more years. And yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'll yeah. just, I'll just mention for a second that the, the path of awakening, as, as, as grandiose as this sounds, is literally just repeat that thing over and over again. Find, find a good teacher, find a good community, but it's just that. And it's no harder than that. It just repeat that until it sinks in, right? And, and 
we know how long something would take to sink in, right? We've tried to learn some silly skill. Like I'm going to try to learn to juggle. And it's kind of hard if you do it for two seconds, it doesn't really work or whatever it is. But if you did it for 10 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day, after a short amount of time, you'd be like, yeah, I can do this. This is not a big deal. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just, just for everybody, just to know that it's just through repetition that that's the case. And then um, there was another thing I was going to mention about, uh, about kind awareness. Oh yeah. So I'll also mention that for any insight in meditation, any, any lesson that we learn, and this is the same for psychedelics, right? So imagine some lesson that we've learned that we're like, oh, wow, that really hit me. There's three stages of that in its development. The first stage is just, we, we find out what it is. We're like, oh, I, I've, I've never discovered that that was the case. Or I've never, today we just sort of had a taste, sort of a wave, a, a friendly wave to maybe kind awareness or some of this material that we're talking about. Maybe people have much more experience, but today was mostly just, oh, look, I see who you are. Sort of like a friendship stage. The next stage would be, it's a, like a kind of home where you can know that you can return to it. You're like, oh yeah, I remember you. Okay, let's settle in. I remember this. And it's almost like that you're wearing it like a turtle, you know, wearing its shell. Like I can, I can always return to this place anytime. And it's very powerful to, to know experientially that we can always return to whatever the insight is. If we breathe slowly, we can calm down the nervous system. It's very helpful for all of us, all of our parts to know that we can calm down just by breathing. Then the final stage is that it's just part of our DNA. We cannot perceive the world without that experience. So first we're a visitor, then it's our home. And then we recognize that it was us the whole time. And so when we talk about in IFS, we talk about self energy. Um, it's actually the recognition that that kind awareness, that space around us, that is actually me. And right now I'm looking out towards it, or we might be looking out towards it because we're looking from the perspective of a part, but actually that entire space is, is me. That's who I actually am. Is that, that's my true being. They don't get into that stuff in IFS probably for good reason. Cause it's a little confusing, but that's the premise is that space and that emptiness that can pass right through. That's actually the real me, not the ones that's like you know, stressed and anxious, et cetera. Well, thank you. That was, that was kind of like the question there was how did you, how do you think about that or make sense of that through the lens of IFS? Yep. I know Dick Schwartz has talked in his book, No Bad Parts. He talks about kind of the universal self energy that is kind of all around us that we're just like a drop in the ocean of it in some sense. And I never thought, like I, I kind of had the experience of being out in nature and being able to tap into that, but never just, sitting in my apartment, you know, staring at my kind of messy apartment right now, because I'm about to be moving <laughs> and be like, oh, this here too, you know, it's, yep. it's viewed with that nonetheless. So yeah, super awesome. And I'll stop yammering, give some, some other folks here time to, to share. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. Um, how about uh, David? Yeah, hi there. I uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, so I'm very interested in meditation too, but but really probably from a very scientific angle. Uh, mm-hmm. And so just uh, Yale, uh, I'm a psychiatrist by training, and neuropsychiatrist, but uh, I'm a molecular imager really at Yale. Well, and, uh, well you, you just, I feel like that's a title you must say all, very often, but <laughs> I, because of that, I did not hear a word oh. of it. Will you just say that one more time? Molecular imager. Before that, you said at Yale. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm a psychiatrist and neuropsychiatrist. Right? Okay, great. Uh, that's my training. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, I tend to speak a bit fast sometimes. But, um, and so, uh, but I'm uh, interested in imaging. So we use PET imaging and mm-hmm. study different conditions. But I have a small grant that just started a couple months ago um, trying to investigate experienced meditators. Yeah. And so really what we're looking at is the synapses. And you mentioned some of the research studies before, and I'm hoping this is kind of the next generation of that. And Great. so what we're really trying to do is for the first time, look at like, you know, synapses and living experience meditators to see whether or not they have differences in certain parts of the brain. And basically I want to borrow your brain <laughs> and maybe some other people on the line here, but we're trying to see if we can get some of these folks through uh, and study them. So I don't know if you're interested or if you know. Some yeah. And, and if you, and I've also, you know, I know people and who've participated in uh, these kind of studies. So I, I got a whole list if you want some oh, very I'm, I'm serious, heavy you. hitters. Yeah. How, how should I contact you? What's the best? Uh, email. Email is great. All right. I'll look at your, I'll put, uh, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, anyone's cool. feel, anyone's free to, to email me, please feel free. 
And um, anyone else on the line too? Anyone, if I don't get back to you, I, I really love you. Just email again. <laughs> Things are a lot happening. Cool. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. I have super exciting. It sounds super fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy to talk more. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So Jordan. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the talk. It was awesome. Um, we, I, I was especially enjoyed hearing how you were uh, highlighting values during preparation work because here at Yale, we, um, a few of us here developed a protocol using acceptance and commitment therapy with psilocybin therapy for depression. And so a lot of values, a lot of mindfulness. It's just great to hear you speaking about all these pieces. Um, the question I was going to ask is how, you know, so if, if you front load values during preparation, certainly doing, bringing in mindfulness or meditation during integration is a pretty common practice these days. Mm -hmm. Just curious your approach to that. How do you custom, you know, how do you think about um, in bringing in mindfulness during the integration phase? How do you customize it? Um, do, do you give people a one of these standard, you know, one of those first 15 exercises that you do? Do you do it for everyone? I'm just curious yeah. how you coach around that. Yeah, and and you mean not during the experience, but but just in integration. Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it ends up being very high touch. I I've, I've been thinking about trying to actually create a course that was a little bit more for, you know formalized around what I would suggest before, during, and after. But right now, it's I just mostly work with people one on one, so it's very much getting into the weeds of like what is occurring in your mind, what happened in the experience, now what's occurring, and, and what's you know that, that kind of thing. So. Um, but largely, um, I'm generally trying to gear people towards kind awareness because to me, it, it, it it's, um, there, you know, you've heard of heart, obviously you've heard of heart practices and meditation. It's different than a practice where you're just producing loving, you know, vibes in the body. It's to recognize that the nature of experiencing is welcoming and that there's this, you know, big swath of experiencing that is outside of any particular part of me. So generally i'm trying to emphasize that i'm then trying to look at parts that are you know struggling largely because my and this is this is not my theory this is literally what ifs is based around but the, the my way of phrasing it's a little different that the wound that is trauma is a part that is fractured off it's separated off and it it has no way to to reconnect and it's just sort of in its own little world of, of suffering or, or, you know, its own little job, but disconnected from what and, and trying to reconnect to what, well, it's actually the totality of experiencing. It's actually the sunlight, you know, sunlight of the spirit or, or awake awareness. Um, it's literally that that part does not have connection with the true, our true self, our true being. And so a lot of what I'm doing is helping people show those parts that meditative process because i can get the meditative process deeply and that part of me that's wounded has no idea and i've literally been in journeys before and taught young parts of myself like how to do breathing meditation like i'd you know that's a very simple skill and i was just teaching it like oh do you know look what happens and the part was like really excited it's just like a little kid like wow and i could tell the part had never heard of anything like that so the parts are fractured off. So they don't know that we know it's okay. They don't know that we know that it's safe. So a lot of what I'm teaching those parts is, is you know, the values and teaching the parts um, about the safety and, and beauty of the world. The other thing I want to say is my take is that what values are is unburdened parts. A part that is unburdened and free of its job and can do whatever it wants is a value. It's like, yeah, I want to explore. I love exploring, right? That sounds to me like a, a, you know, a part of me really loves to explore. And so that's largely what we're working on is to defracture the system that way. I don't know if that, that answers the question at all. Yeah, no, I appreciate those thoughts. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'd love to talk more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daniel. Thanks so much for your talk, really appreciate it. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on self-assessment during the path. And so if you don't, if you're not part of a Sangha or on retreat where you have mm -hmm. kind of a one-on-one -on -one people to give you feedback, 
what are some resources or general thoughts you have on how to self-assess, see where you're at, see what type of thing is helpful to work on, what you're doing well on, et cetera? So one of the things that is really challenging is the fact that in a sense, we, I don't, maybe, maybe we don't, but from my experience, we very much need other people. And there's no real tradition of somebody practicing meditation alone. We have all of these images of somebody in a cave really doing their thing. And they're, you know, just there for 15 years, but that, that monk who sits in the cave for 20 years, right. They have community members bringing them food every day. That's how they survive, right? So we have this sort of westernized cowboy version of meditation and the, and the, the deep side of the path, which is effectively free of and free and independent. But that's the exploratory drive, which is important. But the community drive is also extremely important. And so I, I don't know of a system that is autonomous, that functions on its own Um that can bring people to this deep material. Typically it is some contact with the teacher or community. Um, and then ideally you have a versatile enough set of skills that whatever problem you're facing, you can feed it back into the meditation. One, one of the ways that I teach different techniques is that the technique has to be able to handle all problems. So for instance, uh, kind awareness, right? If there's a part of me that does not feel kind awareness, well. The, the, the phrase that I use that if I think of what kind of awareness would say, if it could say something is of course, of course. And I'm just walking around. If there's a part of me, that's like, I'm, I'm hurt. I don't get it. I say, yeah, of course that makes sense. Of course. And so I want to practice that will be able to metabolize any problems. And so typically all I'm working with students is they have a problem and like, well, how does the practice metabolize this? And I say, well, have you tried doing X and like, oh yeah, of course. And then they realized they had the tool the whole time. They just forgot or that something was missing. So that's my general take, but we do very much need each other for this to, for this to work. Hopefully that's not disappointing. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's great. I, I feel like I, I get most of my practice and information from Sam Harris's waking up app. And I love it. And, um, but it's, I'm receiving as opposed to a two-way street that I would in a in-person yeah. community. And, and there's really excellent teachers who, who taught Sam, you know, so find those. I mean, honestly, it's like, it's just, it's just a different thing to find the people who are actually doing it and to interact. And of course, then it makes the practice much more interactive, much more um, about the fiber of interacting and asking questions and being there for other people. It's, it weaves it into a different part of our life. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Rob, do we have time for one more question? Okay, great. Suki. Hi. Nice uh, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, I was on the retreat that Janusz was talking about, and the kind of awareness uh, was really enlightening for me, and the silent meditation was more enlightening than I ever could have imagined. But I'm a lay person. I've been meditating for a long time, but I'm still new to psychedelics, new to a lot of what this is doing in terms of awakening. And what happens to me is when I'm conscious, I can hold on to these concepts quite well. But when I'm terribly triggered, I can't access kind of awareness. Mm -hmm. When I've got that expanse of trees in my mind from the retreat, I can manage kind of awareness. Mm -hmm. But what do I do when I've lost touch with those parts that I can't even say the words, of course, yeah. Of course you're angry. Of course you're upset. Yeah. What could you tell us to, yeah. to help with that? Yeah, so there's a few things. One is that we're trying to, those things are just going to happen. So that's the hard part. They will happen at times. What we're trying to do is reduce the intensity, reduce the frequency, reduce the length. And so it might seem like, well, am I really growing? I still have this, this really difficult experience that happens once every you know, three days. Well, how long is it? How long is the recovery afterwards? How deep do I go into it? How disruptive, disruptive is it in my life? And over a long time, a long period, you can see it actually is changing through this practice. And you know, I, I know you personally, you're working very hard. So I think you're doing a lot of what you can do uh, to, to move forward. But it is a numbers game. And so the more you can meditate, the more you can practice, the more you can go to retreat, it is shifting the process 
forward. I, I would I would be reticent to say the more you do journeys, because you really do need to space those out and you really need to have the processing time. Um, the other thing that I would say is just on a very technical level, um, there's two things, and you, you've heard me talk about one, and I'm gonna talk about another. One is basically what I call prayer position. Now, I'm not a believer or disbeliever in God. I think it's a very useful piece of technology, honestly. I think it's really useful. Um, and when one is praying, right, there's a kind of reaching out to something that is not there. There's a separation. You're trying to bridge that gap and you're trying to get to something that you um, need or want or need guidance from or need the love from or whatever it is. You're reaching out. So in this case, prayer position is reaching out to that known experience of that freedom and that peace and that everything's okay, even if you're not there. And it's often, it's desperate. It's like, please, please, where are you? The one thing I would recommend, make sure to reach out in all directions. Because the one directional reaching out, you're still using the laser of the mind and it can just create more separation. Everything is like separate because we're like, come on, where are you? You're over here. Whereas if we start to open up and pray basically in all directions, it by its nature starts to pull us out of that central sort of gravitational pull. You can also check if I'm in the center, what am I separate from? And start to use awareness to be like, I'm separate from this thing. I can't contact, but it starts to open awareness in that way. The last thing I want to mention, which is something I just realized very recently for myself, was if you do that turn back process where you look for, okay, I am in pain. Where is me? Where literally, where is it located? And try to find that. It can create a kind of tension because you don't want to scrunch up your face or tense your face, but to actually find where is the self located, you can't find it. You can't locate where that is. And that sort of, it feels like two magnets that won't meet. That sort of, in a sense, like disorientation opens up the possibility of awareness becoming larger. So if you do that and, and point towards like, where is the part, the self that is in pain right now, you won't be able to find it because you can't find any self. They're, they're unlocatable typically, unless you're outside of it. That's when we say, oh, this part of me is over here. But if it's me, we're fully blended. Um, we can't locate that. And so that opens up the possibility that actually there's just more around us in that way. But then I'll also mention, you know, we want to have all the things in place like family who's around us and, and support, support network. And, and we, you know, have a routine. I have a dog, which is like such a godsend because the dog needs to go out. So it's like, as you know, bummed out as I can be or whatever happens, I have to leave the house. I have to go walk around. So having this kind of routines that actually get us to go into the world are powerful and important. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. If I can just jump in briefly, there was a question in the chat about uh, meditation groups in New Haven. Uh, briefly, there's the New Haven Zen Center, which is a Rinzai group. And then there's Elm Community Insight. Um, if you just Google New Haven Zen Center and Elm Community Insight, those are those are two meditation groups that I'm aware of. There's there's also, and I know this, uh, maybe it's further away, but there's a famous Connecticut Insight community and i forget their names at this moment forgive me but they're like a very well if you you probably if you search up search connecticut insight um you're going to uh find some stuff i saw there was uh, another hand raised dennis i don't know or i'll also just mention that if you if you're if it's of interest we typically are doing a live meditation every other day on on uh on um twitch so you can follow us on Twitch right now. We're on hiatus for the summer, but we're starting back up in September. Um, but also if you, you know, download those meditations and um, you can stay in contact in that way and we can all reach out and say hello. Yeah, I'll say briefly before Dennis, we get to your question. Um, when we do post this video on YouTube, we're gonna include a bunch of Nanish's resources and websites and things like that. So if it feels like it's just, going blowing by oh, yeah, so many pieces <laughs> and our and ps our youtube channel which is a whole set of resources and interviews and and we have two YouTube, we have two youtube channels i always forget to plug my people my friends are like you gotta plug mm -hmm. so we have two youtube channels one that's like longer four more edited stuff and then one that is like oh, a thousand live streams each of one has a, an original meditation that is you know geared towards specific things so you can search kind awareness and find 20 meditations and that the address for that is, and I think I can put it right in the chat, youtube.com slash deep mindfulness and the number two. Oh, good. 
you're gonna you're gonna earn a, at least one new subscriber from me so looking forward that's to oh yeah and, and then of course the regular youtube channel is just youtube.com slash deep mindfulness wait yeah is this going to the whole group or just an individual right oh now? you're right it is thank you so much yeah. let's do that again and then and then the, here's the regular one awesome cool well thank you do you have time for for one? yeah I, I, can, I can totally stay for one more all right well then let's dennis if you want to ask your question go for it yeah thank you for your lecture for your meditation for mm -hmm. practice for your work uh, please can you um, explain what actually we have when we micro dosing with mushrooms and meditation uh, this synergy is correctly be like uh, more powerful than uh, just uh, meditation or not I, I would i would be very reticent to say it is more powerful it is just a different lens and so if you meditate while walking it's going to be different than if you meditate while lying down is going to be different than if you meditate while swimming or sitting um, if you meditate while you've had coffee it's going to be different so effectively you're just going to notice something specific something different um i don't do a ton of meditation while microdosing personally um but i think it's worth an experience if you're already microdosing it might be worth the experiment, but I also typically will recommend just make sure you get used to the skill outside of any particular altered state. Um, I, I generally also, um, I, 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 you know, I used to smoke a lot of pot. I quit many, many years ago, like 15, 18 or whatever years ago. I, it, I tend to just doesn't work for me. So as far as an altered state, sometimes people will try to use marijuana. I found it really doesn't work. And the other thing is that some psychedelics actually mess with your concentration. So there could potentially be a downside. You want to check and see if you get your concentration going, you're pretty stable. And then you add in, you know, a microdose of whatever. Does that actually just destabilize you? And the mind is just very, you know, creative and bouncing and doesn't actually uh, help you develop that kind of stability you want and the kind of depth of continuous practice that you want. So I would just ask those questions of your own practice. And one more question, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, what do you think about uh, sacred uh, plants and medicine in the core of Buddhism, like um, the main um, path throughout uh, this culture? Whether they were using plant medicines at that time? Uh, no, uh, they use uh, med plant medicine or sacred uh, mushrooms, uh, mm -hmm. amrita, soma, etc. So they uh, make a study about Buddhism, how it works, how to meditate. And uh, after 5, 10, 20 years uh, ago, they do sacred medicine and they come to the first point and do the same all the time. So what does it mean um, from your experience? What do you think about it? Yeah, well, I, I think I understand the question, but basically, you know, again, the, 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 the psychedelic is gonna get whatever you feed into it. So if somebody's a very serious meditation teacher, I mean, it's worth noting that I, you know, uh, got sober in 2004 and uh, have you know touched no psychedelics of any kind for many many years, and then at some point and got but really liked the psychedelic psychedelic experiences that I had had previously, and so really dove into the psychedelic side of meditation and eventually began teaching it. And I say the psychedelic, I mean the awakening side, and it was uh, deeply transformative, and it was very much like the psychedelics I had experienced, except it was my perception all the time, um, and. Um, it was uh, powerful to see that I didn't need any medicine to get there. And I remember actually having a particular experience that, that there was a moment when I was on retreat and suddenly I was like, oh, this is like that big, big peak experience that I had on, you know, psilocybin and LSD at the same time, like way back when, when I was like, oh, this is what awakening is. This is the same experience, but it didn't feel like the peak. It felt like very much the beginning of this huge path that I, you know, when I was taking a medicine, it felt like it was the peak. When I did it, 
myself, it very much was clear that this is the beginning of an incredibly wide spectrum of a deeply transformational process. So my general stance is, you know, they can be really nice pointers and show us certain things, but ultimately it is the practice and, you know, silent retreat and community and finding teachers that you like and trust and feel really, um, help you can help you experience the material that for me at least has been the thing that's driven the transformation forward beyond you know beyond anything else so thank you so much for that question thank you thank you well um i'll just say on behalf of everybody who is here and who was here thank you so much this was a a really wonderful wonderful talk i'm super grateful that you shared your time and, and your wisdom with us um yeah, it's always a little bit of a downer when we have to do the Zoom round of applause, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If we can all just offer some form of appreciation for for Yana sharing so much time, and um, yeah, you you've plugged your stuff. Is there anything else you want to plug though before before you go? That's it. I'll just say I'll put those those fifty meditations in the chat again. I really uh, reach out to me. Um, uh, please uh, let me know. How, I, I mean, try those meditations. Um, the email, I'll put that in the chat too. Um, anything that I can, you know, any way I can be helpful, please let me know. Well, thank you. You've already been super helpful. Um, and I feel like this is, you know, building good karma here. It's going to keep on awesome. building. So yeah, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for coming. If you're not on our newsletter, feel free to join it and you'll be updated about future events where hopefully we'll see you there. Um, so I hope you all have a good rest of your day or night, wherever you happen to be. And thank you again, Janish, for coming. Thanks, guys. See you all soon. Thank you.